Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are recording once again, and I have to avoid legal snags by telling people that <laughs> yeah, you're being recorded, my man. Just uh, so thank you. you. Good, good to see. Good to see. Good to know. Good to know. Um, hello, people. We we thought we would do another love stream because it's how we roll. And um, but I, I would I would like to start out first by by this quick public service announcement because this is important. Um, Pierre has at his the Siderata pen company has a YouTube channel, and. Um, you are by no means obliged to, but we will stop liking you if you don't subscribe to that channel. We would really, we it is it is a pretty serious matter to us, and we would we won't take it personally, but we will be really offended if you do not subscribe to that channel. Of course, I'm kidding, but but it's the the subscribers, of course, always appreciate. It. Is yes, there anything? Absolutely. Is there anything I'm missing on that? Or? Uh, no, I think it's just Desi Dorada Pen Company. Uh, yeah, just find it, hit the subscribe button. I will, uh, once we get enough subscribers for YouTube to let me talk again, uh, I can give you some inside scoops on what I'm doing, how I'm doing, and what I just have. I spend my business model trying to make stuff that's worth buying, worth thinking about. And uh, if you care about pens, I, I really think that I've got some things that are worth thinking about. You might not like it all, but it's at least worth a listen. So subscribe. And that's okay. Please. You may not like it. You may not like that's okay. We have we have we have started this with the I think one of our missions is to show people that you can disagree on things. It's okay. <laughs> you can talk about things with someone you may disagree with, and that's okay. And here's the most shocking thing of the evening. People can have an opinion that differs from yours, and that's okay too. Sometimes, well, you know, depends on the opinion because maybe you're just wrong. But you know, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, like Stephen was about the Parker Fifty One last week. But, yes, you know. exactly. You see, that's a clear case where I was wrong, <laughs> and I was corrected, and I'm still alive, and we still love each other, and it's still good, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. So there you see. So, uh, what do we got this week? Uh, well, let me see. Um, well, I, you know, there was a comment thread that we uh, that, that we got pretty early on from my talk last week mm -hmm. uh, about racism in uh, as, as it pertains. I think briefly when I were talking about public schools, and there's two things mm -hmm. that are worthwhile. One, talking about the position of racism in public schools. You know, and when we say that, we, we you know we have to flesh out just what we mean with all of our terms because yep. you know we mean different things. Uh, to, by, by saying the same words sometimes. But moreover, uh, it's worth making a quick note that your experience, and not you, Stephen, but just in general, a person's experience is their truth, but it is not necessarily a fact, mm -hmm. and it is not necessarily a representation a, a statistical slice of something. So I think if you hear somebody say something <clears throat> and it doesn't go with your lived experience, that doesn't make what they said untrue. It doesn't make your experience true either. There are perhaps different experiences that I think everybody can probably get behind. It's pretty basic, pretty simple, but the thing that I think the next step that you have to go to is if there are, in fact, multiple experiences, the question is, well, what does it mean? And I think some people get the feeling that I think they retreat into this way of saying, well, everybody's got different opinions. All opinions must be the same. You know, then there's then there's no, you know, kind of nothing matters. And, and I would say that that is uh, that is not true. Mm -hmm. I think you can have an experience and I think you can have uh, you can you can pull things out of the experience and that can all be true for you. But I think if you uh, I think if you do a little bit of work on what that what what information is contained in that experience, you can get places. And I think those places are kind of those places can be real. And I, I forget who I told this to a couple of years ago, but I think I fleshed out kind of like a a two-pronged, four-output way of looking at how I assimilate 
uh, the information that I get, rather through my own personal experience or from what I hear. And you think of it as like, I wish I had a diagram, but you know, this is just off the top, I don't have one. You imagine you, you, you pour your information into your bucket and it comes out in two spouts. Uh, information is just whatever you get. So something you see, something you hear about, whatever. And you ask the question, is this, can this be objectively verified? Uh, or an interesting one is, can you prove it wrong with real evidence? If you can, then you go on the one side. If you can't, goes into something else. For the things that go into the one side of, can we prove this wrong? Or can we prove this right with empirical evidence? You know, once it goes onto the one side, depending on what that evidence shows, what you've got is either a fact or a lie. You get those two buckets, and that's the end of it. Facts and lies. Mm -hmm. The other one, because there's no necessarily empirical proof to verify if this is right for you, right or not, you have to go through some work, some personal work, maybe some self-reflection on the other side, and you can get one of two ways. You consider it, and if it works out for you, and it'll take you a while because this is something that you, because it's not a fact, it's something that you arrive at gradually. You consider it, and it can possibly work out someplace uh, called personal truths. Truth. If you don't do that, and you take this information, and you don't consider it, and you say, try and use it, you're pulling on what I call blind faith, or you haven't considered it. And that's where my, those are my four little buckets. And I think when people think about their experiences, it's worth running it through that diagnostic. Can we empirically prove this? Can we empirically disprove it? Yes or no? Is it a fact or not? If we can't, it doesn't mean it doesn't have value, but mm -hmm. we have to do some reflection. we got to do a little work on it. How you do that work, that's the beauty of it. That's up to you. Either you end up with a blind faith or a personal truth. And I think you got to, that's the stuff that we want the most. I think that's the most valuable side uh, for us as human beings. For, the, for us as people who want to eat and sleep and build things and make coalitions and function in society, we need the facts and the truths. The facts and the, the we need to be able to create the facts and lies. That, that bucket is more mm -hmm. important then. But yeah. I think this is, I think it's just my, my little one bucket, four outputs way. Uh, you know, so that was the thing I was thinking about uh, based on that little, that, uh, that the thing on, on, on YouTube. And, I, and I'm glad that, uh, that the person who made the comment finished off the video and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. So there you go. So that's what's up. I think that's a really neat way of looking at things. And I, I think that um, a lot of people don't necessarily do that kind of testing. And the result of that is that you may conflate certain outcomes with each other and that you may end up believing that something that could be say a lie a non something that is objectively not true can become a, a, for example a personal truth to you even though it should not be but i think that this is something that we we see um, qu quite a lot um, currently maybe but in in general i think we we see quite a lot of that yeah. and there are risks yeah uh the, it's it's hard when you don't know about the idea of disprovability um disprovability i think that's a made-up word but it just you know can this thing be proven false yes if yeah it, falsifiability it, i guess yeah yeah right right yeah. And, you know yeah. and like those it really gets. Not, I don't want to go on too much of a of a rant rant here, but gosh, flat earthers. I, I would love to get a flat earther and ask him just straight up, what? Why do you care? Because mm. if you told me that the world was flat, like if you know, if if I got a, if I got some 
some real proof that the world was flat, it wouldn't make a difference to me whatsoever. I'm trying to live my life. I don't care. I want to know, why do they care so much? Because, and and the stuff that they use as their proofs, you know, a lot of what I've been hearing is when you try to, you know, false, you know, prove that their their assumptions are false. They just, you know, they just move around a little bit and they try to mm-hmm. say, no, 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 that's not true. Question the data, which which I suppose is fine, but you got to start asking, you know, what's what's behind all this? Do you? I don't think you care that it's a fact or not a fact. I think you want it to be something else. Yeah, I I, I wonder about that a lot. Um, not too much. I got coronavirus on our minds, but I do wonder about it. Yes, that. yes, yes. Nice. Yeah. yeah, no, no, but that is that is nice. I understand what you mean. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because it becomes it becomes a, at some point it becomes a um, I think a much bigger issue than 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 in reality it it, it needs to be. Which, I agree, which which suggests that there's something I don't know something something another driving factor behind that 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 extends and that grows beyond what what the actual topic is about. Yeah, that's that's interesting yeah. way to look at things. Yeah, uh, like I wonder. Um, one of my piano students has a has a, a I think it's a cousin who during during a dinner just started spouting insane American conservative talking points about something and you know it's it's the most inflammatory type of language mm-hmm. possible. I don't remember the details and, uh, and and the student was talking about this guy and I thought. You know, it's I, I can't and, and 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 they brought it up at the end of a lesson, and there wasn't a lot of time to unpack what was said or you know. But I was thinking, you know, some people I know, in my experience, really just like to feel special, <laughs> and you know, I think, I mean, I want it. I, I like to feel special, um, but you know, maybe maybe that's maybe that can play a part for some people. Uh, it's frustrating to hear somebody say damaging things and things that if not questioned, just takes the average IQ of the whole room down uh, just because, I mean, maybe because they want to feel special. I mean, maybe they want to feel like they've got something that nobody else has figured out and maybe that makes them feel good. Uh, you know, uh, not to not to keep pinballing, but on that same kind of emotional thread, I was reading this thing in the New York Times a few weeks ago about a, a woman who got into the world of American the white, the American white nationalist movement. And, uh, I think the person who wrote the article said that people don't leave white supremacy or the white nationalist movement because they realize that what they were doing was wrong. They leave it because it no longer suits them. Mm-hmm. Like in this case, this woman joined and it was, you know, in as much as you can join, I, I don't understand yeah, the yeah, details, yeah. but but, you know, there's like you might you might run into trouble if you would want to join such an organization. It, it you might run into some issues. It's... I, I think that guy K Kamau Bell. I can't. Remember, he's a comedian. He he went to a Klan cross burning, and he's big, tall, black, <laughs> Afro, and he uh and that was that was some some unfortunate television because I, he he went to some of that stuff and he made it out okay. He brought a camera crew with him, and I think there was one bit where he met up with somebody under cover of darkness and the person wore a hood because they didn't want anybody to see him. But I, I was disappointed with that little bit because I felt like he was angling to try to generate comedy as opposed to finding truth. I see. And I yeah. really wish that he, I really wish that he had gone deeper with that, but, um, Oh gosh, darn it. Oh yeah. So this, so this woman, uh, she joined, uh, more or less joined this white nationalist thing because I think she was, I mean, it sounded like she was just kind of had low self-esteem and was lonely. And then, uh, and, you know, didn't have a lot of purpose. I think she had a couple of kids, but once they got old enough to where they could take, do more on their own, she didn't have any direction. And, you know, it just, she got kind of swept up into it. And then she discovered bodybuilding and that gave her a community. And then she left, you know? Right, right. Yeah. Like you just white supremacy for community? Uh, yeah, that, yeah. I mean, that's, 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 that's it. <laughs> no, I, it's it's weird, but but I but I think there is something to that because I I think I think as as a species we 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 long for for the, the, that sense of, of belonging and, and being being a part of something. Whether it's it could be something like say a fountain pen community, or it could be something like I collect stamps, or I am I am a, a gun enthusiast, or like I whatever like whatever. Like we we seek that that I, I belong to this and and that and the. 
uh, so I think there's yeah I think that is that's correct I, I think that's that's true it's it's interesting if white supremacy becomes the the community that you seek out um, but but it, it is again it is part of being yeah being part of something uh, that that but and and then that, I, I think that was a very sharp argument because I think that that you can exchange an, an ideology like that for something like bodybuilding does suggest that there is it, it, it wasn't about the supremacy stuff it, it was about i want to i want to be i want to matter as well right and that's you know, uh, and, and i hold i still hold that against that woman still hard because white supremacy is a lie yeah. lives have been lost because of this i'm sorry that you had to go through this to to find yourself but holy moly that's a, it's like has a lot to buy into yeah so oh yeah no, I, I you, couldn't I mean, agree more you eat right you work out the right workouts yeah you know it, it, no, who's the victim here yeah i, I, get, I was gonna say it, it doesn't require the eradication of large uh, groups of people so that's kind of convenient. Right. <laughs> right i mean if you want to go build a find a bodybuilding colony you know, where you have to be able to at least bench double your body weight to get in. I mean, yep, you know, or you yep, know, strictly yep. speaking, I, you know, I should know bodybuilders are not necessarily strong men or strong people because you can yes. be a bodybuilder and still be an average strength. It's about yep, size, yep. not about power, which yep. I think is kind of silly. But, you know, you know, what? It, but, you know, if the, who's going to hate on me for that? The bodybuilders. And again, I'm not too afraid because they look worse than they are. So that's fine. <laughs> Yeah, plus you're like um, plus you're like like eight feet tall or something. People, don't, you don't realize this. You don't realize this when you see Pierre sitting there like that. But I met him in in DC, and and he, he says something like, show, "Show me your hands." And we we did the hand comparison. Fairly large hands. People, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. This Pierre is like his hands are like three times. Well, not that. Like I'm, I'm, I'm totally exaggerate. Like five oh, times the size oh. of my hands. Like it's huge. Like he was drinking like barrels of like stuff. No, I wasn't, like, but you have no idea how, oh, how tall is, Pierre is. Like yeah, there you go. There's a fucking barrel right there. <laughs> it's, it was right. Anyway. Two ounces of water here, baby. Yeah. There you go. hydration. And he drinks like fifty of those a day, man. He have no idea. But he needs to stay alive. Anyway. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah. no. But Pierre is six oh, feet, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, but but still, but we don't want this to be some sort of like see if you can take down Pierre Chow, you know. It's, it's, <laughs> well, it's no, not what it's about. It's, not, it. it's a love stream, man. It's a love yes. stream. It's not. No, we all it's love. Personal love, love, stream. We all love each other. And I don't oh, think you. I didn't. I didn't. For the record, I didn't experience that as you. You harping on some sort of like bodybuilding community. Uh, that, okay. Okay. But, okay. But, Just uh, making I, sure. No, I don't. I don't think that came across away. And even if it did, then then of course that was not the intention. But that was just an example. You know, I, I wonder about that. When I hear uh, an interview with a political leader, sometimes you get the impression that when somebody says something on television, uh, that people look for the way in which it can be the most offensive. And I don't just mean a reporter trying to get a good sound bite. I mean anybody. It's like we try to we just assume that the, that whoever it is has is working in bad faith. Mm-hmm. And we don't want to give them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, and I know benefit of the doubt is something that you realistically need to assess over time. You know, like when when one political leader that I especially dislike for their hypocrisy says something good, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to give them credit for it because yes. I know other things that they've said. But, you know, uh, I don't know what's going on there. I, I mean, like when I like like me covering my butt thinking that a bodybuilder might hear this and say, oh, you know, screw you, Pierre. You know, hey, I do what I want to do. Uh, I didn't think it was that crazy. I don't know. Are we are we treading into anti-political correctness right now, Stephen? No, I think I think it's just, but, but, but this is a, I, I do think this is a trend that people, I think people also, no, I think you, you, you put that really well. Like you, you are, go not you but i mean one people go into things assess people thinking that they are they're not acting in good faith that they are that they're not uh, do do not have the uh, the collective interest in mind or something but they so what you get into 
And I can give a, a very quick, stupid and, and, and meaningless personal example uh, of, of this um, f- from, from a YouTube video. I, I, um, I, I did a video and I'm struggling to remember what the topic was, but it was not a review. It was more an opinionated uh, uh, video on, on yeah, again, I've, I struggle with, to remember what the, what the topic was. But too in any case, content, yeah, too much videos, man, too much videos. Yeah. Um, and, and someone commented and said, I, I'm paraphrasing something along the lines of, could we just let this man do his videos because after pretty much every sentence he had to justify himself like well piston fillers do this and that but if you if you like piston fillers it's okay gold nibs are like but but you know if you i'm not saying gold nibs are bad and i thought yeah it's true but i but but that's because if i don't do that then yes, there will be a bunch of people like, yeah, but I like p- piston fillers are the God's gift to mankind and you suck and that kind of, then I, then I get that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, I was talking with a, a, a person about doing a fountain pen collaborative and we were talking about what kind of thing, what kind of material sell. Yeah. And, you know, we got two pieces of information. We got what people say on, on what people say in the places where they can talk. And then what people actually buy. And there's yeah. a disconnect there. Mm-hmm. And what people, I think the people who say, the people who are energized about a certain type of material are much more vocal about it, I think, than the general population says. Most people just maybe f- think it, feel it, but don't feel the need to say much about it. And then when it comes time to um, actually put their money where their mouth is, those guys are discovered to be kind of in a minority. Yeah. So while we, on the one hand, for example, are talking about fountain pen materials, hear a whole lot <clears throat> about loud, the loud, dramatic stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, really, you know, loud, dramatic colors. You know, I'm not trying to get down on them, but just the, you know, the loud, pretty stuff. You know that, but that, you know, hearing about that, you know, it's still, it, you got to be informed by the fact that we still sell more black pens than anything else. Yes. Black. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I do wonder about that. Like how many people you're like when you're catching yourself. I, uh, I, I don't know. It could just be that the people that that 3% of people who are so sensitive that they need to say something at every, whatever it is. Exactly. And just, I, you know. I think that's a good point because what, what, what happens and that's what I, what I was trying to get at earlier. Like I, I think that people, are now i don't want to say now more than ever it's possible that just because we have an internet and we have social media we have all the things we didn't have before that we realize it more now but i think people get incredibly offended not everyone but but the threshold for being offended has gone down and people very quickly oh yeah that's offensive like oh you said something about that pen but i love that pen so you're wrong you know, I I gotta I gotta I gotta disagree on that. I think you, you you might have something, but I'm not sure that I'm ready to say that the human being, that the Homo sapien yeah. who sees things and gets impressions and has reactions, is markedly different from the Homo sapien of say, <clears throat> because I'm this old, the early nineties. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I think people just have. I think it's just so easy to say something. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and you know the usual way to say it in the easiest way that you can say something anonymously, yeah. nothing else, just to just type words on a page. I think that it's just so easy that you know the barrier to make a comment is just low enough that you get about it so much more. Yes. Because I was thinking, like in the, in the early '90s, if you wanted to buy something, mm-hmm. you had to go to a store, yep. and if you didn't like what you bought, what were your what was your recourse? There's no Yelp, there's no social media, so pretty much you could either get a return, maybe try to sell it, or just sit on it and say, well, that's too bad. Uh, uh, Yelp is Yelp is great for a lot of reasons because of that, but that's pretty much it. You know, if I'm not mistaken, like, uh, I, I mean, there was a company that I used to buy when I was, I used to build scale models, mm-hmm. and they had a lot of, you know, tools that they would mm-hmm. sell for, for models, really little stuff. Right. And, and, you know, some of that was crap. And 
you know, if I bought something that was no good or, you know, it was touted as one thing I didn't like, I didn't have nowhere to go. You know, okay, well, too bad. Well, I guess, you know, throw that away. Move on. Mm-hmm. You know, that was it. But but now, I mean, if I don't like it, I can I can go to their website and send them send somebody an email. And I suppose I can make a YouTube video about it. And I can get on Facebook and trash them somewhat. And then I can get on Reddit and find the other 60 guys on the planet who, who bought the same thing and had the yeah. same experience. Yeah. And we all get together and we have a fuss. You know, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. I, think, I, I got to disagree. I think it's, it's just so easy. I think it's too easy. Yeah. Not too easy, but it's very easy. It's, but yeah, it's become easier for sure. Right, yeah. especially now, yeah, and and that, that can lead to an interesting dynamic. I, I I think it's a good I think it's a good viewpoint, um, and that's also what I meant. Like I don't know if it's if it's become more of a thing or if we're more aware of it, but maybe the better way to look at it is that yeah, it's, it's just become as you said, it's become easier. The the threshold to do this kind of stuff has just gone down. It's become easier, and it is an issue because I remember I talked at some point to uh, a pen vendor. Um, that I should leave anonymous, but who, who said, uh, we we deal with this. Like, this was a personal conversation. We deal with this because I get people in the store, the brick and mortar store, who say, I want X discount on this pen. And then they say, yeah, we, we can't give you that discount. They say, well, if you don't give me that discount, I'm going to leave you a bad review. And if I leave you a bad review, then people are going to see that. And you know what it's like. Like, you can have 10 good reviews, but if you have one negative review, then people say, oh, I'm not going to buy there. The negative review, man. So, I mean, so that, 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 that which is a problem, right? So, the, 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 you're kind of like, you, you they, 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 to use a colorful expression, but I mean, like, they, they then they have you by the balls. And they, they the people manipulate you into doing that damned because... Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Exactly. So these are the consequences if you don't do that, which is it's, it's I, 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 I almost it's like the black bales like you, you just you just go in. You, you, you know, I you know, I referenced this a little bit last week and 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 I I talked to my property management friend about this. You know, forgive me for doing a bit of a rerun. But, you know, of all the people who pay their rent. The vast majority of people pay it on time. Yes. A little bit of people who don't pay the rent on time, the vast majority of them will tell you and will work with you and will try their best to get you the money as soon as they can. It's just that little bit of people who yes. are not reasonable, who are not rational, who don't want to play by the system, who want everything their way that you hear the most about. But I figure most people are, say, to, to go back to this analogy, most people are going to agree with me. The few people who don't agree with me, most of them are going to be okay about it. It's just a little mm-hmm. bit they're going to be real jerks. Yeah. So I feel like if you just what I try what I've tried to do is just do what I'm going to do, and somebody's going to disagree with it. Somebody, you know, somebody's not going to like it. But if somebody's going to just rag on me, like if I get one of those a subset of the negative subset, uh, I feel like most people will take at least a cursory glance at what else is out there before they make a decision. Yeah. So if I go to a website, like if this guy is, has some jerk who's trying to whittle him in on the price, I would, I mean, I've been there at a show where someone doesn't want to pay my fee and they go, and if they, and if they felt like, you know, bad talking to me later, I feel like that's fine. I've built enough of a backbone somewhere that if that blows up in my face there, there's enough that didn't blow up. That's okay. That's out there, and will because it's the internet will always be there. That you know, a reasonable person will be able to just say, look at the context, and say, okay, maybe this was a bum. Maybe he ran into a bum. Uh, you know, and I think you know, and that's one of those articles where I don't think that's I don't think this is a this is a personal truth. This is not this is not factual. Yes, that's just what I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I, I find that fascinating, and that is something that I am. I will say, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly happy that I don't. I don't have a customer base really. I don't sell a product. I do my reviews, and that's that's it. And that that you know, so I I don't, I don't have to have to deal with that. And that is something that I, I sometimes dread, but you know. Dread? Why? Well, I don't know. It to me, it sounds like the. Even if it doesn't happen often, 
I think I would struggle with with dealing with those kinds of scenarios, like, like the deal, like the 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 interaction with someone like that, being that I, I think to me that would be a difficult thing to do. Hmm. I'm uh, so I'm everyone every week I get to talk to you and I get to know you a little bit better. Uh, if you're comfortable talking with it, I would love to hear more about why you might find that uh, the way that you found it. Uh, it's, you know, we are not the same person. So no, no. the challenges that I feel, are, you know, I can, we can talk about that. But, you know, it, to me, it's it would be, you know, it's not easy having somebody tell you something that is both unfair and threatening. Mm -hmm. and, you know, where somebody effectively is trying to assert their power over you. There, there's that power. It's, it's annoying. But, you know, when somebody's doing that, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, it, it's terrible. But I don't know. If it's not, you know, I guess, you know, we, nobody can make you do anything. Mm -hmm. The only thing anybody can do is try to per persuade you, but uh, you know, like if they uh, if they leave a bad review, like what's the worst? Like I try, I like I, imagining the worst possible scenario, which is unlikely. It's just not as bad as it is. It's not that bad to me, and I guess situations like that are tense and unpleasant and confrontational. But to me, ultimately, not that bad. How do you? Yeah, it? yeah. No, no I know. I, I, I think that's. I think that's how you have to be. I, I think I, 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 I struggle with with confrontation, and 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 that is something that I, I, I find difficult, especially when it, when it is an emotional thing. Um, so when it's uh, when when it's when it's a professional thing, like I mean, I I, I teach students. If a student comes up to me and says, well, "I think I deserved a higher grade," we can have a discussion about that. I don't I don't have an issue with that that conversation or with a colleague too. A, but when it comes to more more personal things, more more emotional things, like this is a product I have made. I have toiled on this. I have I have spent time and effort designing this, creating this. Um, and to then be, to be in a situation like that, where someone approaches you like that, kind of, kind of corners you like that, I would find difficult to deal with. I would find it difficult to, to. I think to remain. I'm just trying to think of what it would feel like for me. Like I would, I, I think I would struggle to stay calm, to not get emotional which doesn't mean like bursting out in tears but like not get angry or 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 snap or or you know that 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 kind of control i think would be hard for me it, it is it is not easy for most people to deal with that um with with that kind of confrontation and we're, and, I'm, and specifically here we're talking about unexpected unjust confrontation you know like you, we're walking down the street yeah you're returning a video you rented cop jumps out of a bush and says what are you doing where are you going what are you doing stop right there you know and you're like <coughs> you know you're, you're, you're gobsmacked mm -hmm. you know that that is it is uh yeah most people would find that kind of you know un unexpected unfair confrontation that again it's you didn't see it coming. If you saw it coming, you'd have time. Yes. You know, but, you know, that kind of thing, it's, it's hard. And I think, I mean, I'm trying to think, who would, who would be good at that? Who would be good at, I mean, you'd have to be like, you, do you know who Max Brooks is? Doesn't do you mean know who Mel really... Brooks is? Yes, 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 yes. His son. Max oh, Brooks. interesting. Yeah, uh, Max Brooks is uh, kind of a, he wrote, I think he wrote books about how to prepare against the zombie apocalypse. Now, I never read any of it, and I never read any of his work, 
but I heard him in an interview uh, <laughs> once, and it was very interesting to hear this point of view of a guy who's just always thinking about the worst case scenario. Right. Uh, I imagine a person like that could be ready at a moment's notice for this kind of a confrontation, perhaps. But it was interesting. He said, I forget what specifically we were talking about, but he said, fear is, fear is fine. Fear is great. Panic is always bad. And you know, I forget. He had, he had more to say about fear versus panic. It was an interview. I think it, it sounds like a Terry Gross fresh air sort of interview. I'm sure somebody can look this up if they link it in the video in yes, the, in the yes. YouTube description. That'd be great. Um, but yeah, that was that was that was that was good to know because it's okay to be afraid. It's okay to feel upset about that sort of thing. But I think when you panic, or rather, it's it's when you feel like you're losing control, is one thing. So when when it, when it jumps up on you, like I'm thinking about this experience I had uh, at a pen show where somebody was whittling me on price. You know, I could feel it coming. So I wasn't quite right. shocked because I could I could see that this guy was where he was going, and I guess I didn't I didn't really feel threatened. Uh, like if I was in that running that store and somebody came up and said, "If you don't give me what I want, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z." I don't know. I mean, I'm the kind of person who would just say, "Okay," and then what? You're still not going to get it at the price you want. Nice. Or, suppose, what, what what happens after that? You know, I, it was always a day after, you know, and I'd be inclined, you know, I'm just thinking like, how would like guys like that? I mean, that's a clumsy extortion. Yes. A smooth extortion requires you to have, I mean, they actually have to have real power. Like, I, you know, there was this TV show that I was briefly getting into watching, but I, I haven't had the time to watch it called Daredevil. Have you ever watched that? No, I, yeah, no, no, no. There, it, it was. It had this really famous scene that it really got me excited about the show. But I had, but I, years passed about mm -hmm. this. There's a, you know, it's about a blind superhero, mm -hmm. and there's there's like something really important behind this door at the end of the hallway, and he has to fight his way to get there. And it's shot really dramatically, and that really got mm -hmm. me jazzed about it. But uh, you know, there's this scene where the bad guys, the bad crime syndicate, find a moderately half good, half bad, okay, nobody. And they say, okay, hey, have a look at this videotape of your daughter. You know, I know, this is the high school that she goes to, and this is her, her uh, uh, the, the park that she likes to play in. And you see that guy over there? Wave to the camera. Yeah, him? Yeah, he can do really good stuff. He's really good with his hands, you know? Like, that is compelling extortion. And under a circumstance where there's legitimate power, I would say, okay, well, then it's not anything that you need to worry about. You fold. Give him what he wants. Give him the yes. fucking wallet. Yes. It's simple. No question. Here's the money, man. See you later. <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, but if it's not that, like, I, I don't see the, I don't see the dilly dally. You know, you, you give him what he wants or you don't give him what he wants. That's it. And, you know, he wants what he wants. If you're willing to pay it, pay it. If you're not willing to pay it, don't pay it. I don't know. I, I guess, I don't know. Maybe I'm on the spectrum or something. I'm just, I'm not getting it. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't, I don't think you're on the spectrum. No, no, no. I don't think you're on the spectrum. If I, I you think. Were, it'd be fine. There's a great reality show about people who are on the spectrum trying to find love. And I think it's great, but it's the same thing that everybody else is doing. We're just people trying to find love. It's the same thing. I think the people who made that, it's on Netflix, they're trying to make us feel sorry for these people. Right. That's, right. I don't like that at all, but you know, whatever. Anyway, go. You were saying, sorry. No, 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 no. I, I think, I think that's, I think that's, that's good. I, I think it's a really good way to, to, to look at these things. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it, 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 it's, 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 it made me think of, um, because we talked about that in the first episode, we talked about the the stoicism and such. And and in a nutshell, stoicism says something along the lines of, because this I was triggered by the um, the the fear is not bad, but but the panic is. So the 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 Stoics, um, it's kind of interesting. One of the famous Stoics is called Epictetus, and Epictetus lectured, and his lectures were written down by one of his students in eight books called the Discourses, but we only have books one to four. Books five through eight disappeared. 
probably two separate volumes and in, in time like five through eight disappeared. The only quote we have from is from the fifth book, which is lost um, and is written down by a, a Roman guy who just wrote a strange book called The Attic Nights uh, because he wrote it in Attica and um, it's sort of a weird gossipy, like weird book, but he, he recounts this story. And I always found it, found it a fun story to, to think about. So there's a guy on a boat and it's written as an eyewitness account. There's a guy in a boat and the boat hits a storm. But this is well before engines. Like this is like the, the, the storm can can mean that the boat will sink. Yeah, yeah. So anything. So they, they, are they going to make it? Are they not going to make it? And on board is a famous stoic master. And so the guy is on this boat. This is a massive storm. He For looks. The record, there's a little bit. It's kind of a little bit lacking in narrative drama because somebody had to tell us a story but yeah yeah exactly it is it is, it is. yeah it is so, so yeah it's so, yeah so so I'll, I'll i'll try to make it more interesting so this is huge huge storm and like you know the rats are jumping off the ship nobody's gonna make it you know it's like it's we're all gonna die we're gonna die think of the children so it's like it's like that so then the, it's, the, the, the protagonist he looks at the stoic master because he thinks, well, everybody's going to die, but he's a stoic. Surely he's going to be like super level and even keeled and calm. And he sees that this stoic is all panicky and white. So afterwards, everything is fine. The boat doesn't sink. Everything is fine. They they disembark. And he goes to this stoic master and he says, I don't mean any disrespect, but you're a stoic master. And I was looking at you throughout this, this giant consternation. And I'm just wondering, like, how does this work? Because aren't weren't you supposed to be completely level and like not upset by any of this, etc.? And the stoic master says something like, "Well, I can explain to you, but it's better if you read it." So he takes out the fifth book of of Epictetus, which was lost, and he doesn't read. And basically, what the guy reads is, even the sage, which is what Stoics aspire to be, like the sage, like like Socrates. There are no sages anymore, but we all try to be a sage. The sage will also, in all his sort of wise enlightenment and all that will still be terrified but then he calms down because the sage can step back and think to himself wait a minute what is really going on is this really terrifying am i really going to die is this certain which ties into what you said before like is this a fact of life is this not a fact etc and then you can take a step back now as a psychologist psychologists would call this cognitive distancing you have this initial emotion Right, you cannot. Like you have that. You have a flash of anger, or a flash of sadness, a flash of whatever. You can't necessarily do anything about that. But then, you can take a step back and you can reason and you can sort of reason your way out of it. So that would be one way to look at this. Comments, please. Uh, I got it. Okay, so there was two thoughts that came to mind. Uh, yeah. So number one, I'm not sure that I really buy that. That sounds yeah. terribly convenient. I think I think he's selling books. Right. Uh, nice. I got. I had, I had two thoughts that came to me. One, oh, hold on. Uh, I've been drinking too much old fashioned. Hold on. He's been. Um, so two things. Uh, back in March, so alligators and uh, fruit cake. Alligators and fruit cake. Uh, so back in March, when the pandemic was, when it was declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization, I sent out a an email that took me eight hours to write uh, to all the people on my subscriber list about, okay, this is like right when stuff was closing down in the, in the United States, when we thought we were going to be like Italy 10 days from now, and everybody mm. was wondering, how, should they panic? What should we do? How do we respond to this? What's going on? And, you know, meanwhile, should we just wait until April when it goes away with the heat? You know, <laughs> there's only yeah. 15 cases. It's, it's, you know, so when we were waiting on that, I said, I started my email. You know, I'll tell you what. Let me. Uh, do you mind if I get this yeah. thing and oh, I can ahead. read you the beginning of it? The reference is. Uh, let me see. Uh, the reference is to a book that <laughs> my my ex girlfriend sent me. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll you know I'll get to it and you'll know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. it says, hey, everybody, I'm from Chicago, and a number of years ago, I dated a woman from a very rural western state. She was the durable, frontier, durable frontiers woman type, and I was the urbane city slicker. Thus, she thought my fear of lions and tigers and bears was hilarious, and she was kind enough to send me a book called When Bears Attack. It had a picture of a very unhappy bear on the cover, and when I got that book, I read it cover to cover in one sitting without blinking my eyes 15 years ago. 
And one anecdote stands out to me right now. If a bear comes into your tent, don't panic, but don't stay calm either. And I thought that was worth bringing up. The rest of the email, I'll deal with that later. Uh, so that came to mind. And the other one was uh, because I, the other one, I think that I think remembering don't panic, but don't stay calm either. That sounds better than trying to dissociate. Uh, mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. second one was, I wondered if you ever heard the alligator story about a guy being chased by a lion who runs an alligator. Did you ever heard this story? I don't think so. I feel like no. It sounds like the sort of thing you might've told me. So it's a, it's an, it's an allegory. Guy is running, running through a field. He's being chased by a lion. Um, he sees that the field is kind of ending and that there's probably a cliff. The lion's gaining on him, so he jumps off the cliff. And he lands maybe 20, 50 feet down later on a small promontory that oversees the river. And it's kind of small, but you can stand up on it. He can walk around. And when he lands on it, he looks over and there's alligators on the cliffs below. And it's a smooth trip back up. So he can't climb back up because it's unclimbable. And even if he did, the lion's just going to be waiting for him. And he can't climb down because there's just alligators underneath. And I think the person, oh, I remember who told me this, actually Shin. Uh, she's, a, she's a calligrapher from Open Ink Stand. She's great. She told me this, and I said, this is a perfect representation of why I think it's worthwhile to think about existentialism. Uh, because the metaphor is death, and it's like certain death is on both sides and there's no way you can get away from it. But here on this little platform, this little promontory is where you can live your life and that's your life now. And I think if you can, once, once you realize you're living your life right now, it, it's, it's worth thinking this is the one, this, this is the life you get to live. It doesn't all, it almost doesn't matter because this is where the metaphor breaks down guy has to eat he has to do other things mm -hmm. but you know the principle is in the moment you, you have what you have and if your life is about to end it scares you but yeah it may it may not but you're still here you're here right now and you're here right now as well and uh you know that's kind of it it's kind of mm -hmm. it's kind of the whole thing right there so those two things came to mind and I imagine I could I would believe that story if the stoic was rocking with the boat, but not screaming, oh, my God, we're all going to die. The stoic might just have decided I could die. I might not die. I don't know. Let me just try to stay in the boat. That's it. Uh, I'd buy that, you know, from perhaps the alligator story. And, you know, don't panic. You know, there's no value in panicking, but it's OK to be afraid. I'd be all right if the guy was just scared the whole time and screaming and calling for his mommy and everything. And, you know, that's, it's okay to be afraid, but he didn't, he didn't start slapping people and, you know, all of the other stuff. Yeah. That's kind of funny when people are just losing. I don't know what people do when they're panicking. You know, I imagine lots of slapping, lots of, you know, fevered head twisting and, you know, needing to be slapped where they can understand, you know, Oh my God, get yourself together. You know, that's there. So, I don't know. That story sounds. Like, that's, I haven't read the story, but you know, it's, it sounds a little, a little bit. I got some questions on it, but anyway, so those two things came to my mind. Nice. I'll stop talking. No, 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 no. That was, that was, that was, that was nice. That was nice. Yeah, no, that's famous. Uh, I think it's also Epictetus who, uh, who quoted something along the lines of, "If um, I am to die now, then I will die. But if I am to die later, then I will have lunch now. For the time for lunch is there." And I will die later, you know. So yeah, that, I, I think that's a. It's a nice way to look at things. If if it is, it, I think life is a is a. Is this sounds like much more profound than it is, but like it's a succession of moments, right? And you you if you if you can, if you get trapped in a certain moment in your in your thoughts or in your emotions or that kind of stuff, then that can really. Um, throw you for a loop, I think, and and you you may forget that it is just a moment, and that moment will pass, which is sometimes easier said than done. Sure, uh, you know nobody ever said being an existentialist was easy, 
when I was dating that philosophy, I, I dated a philosophy linguistics uh, double major from Northwestern a long, long time ago. And uh, she used to say that existentialism is right, but it's the most difficult. And uh, I, I don't know. We, we didn't spend too much time on philosophy. Long, long story short, you know, I, I, I didn't quite buy her presentation that she gave when she was trying to. I think she was getting a master's. But, you know, what, 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 whatever, Natalie, it'll be all right. Um, so there's two episodes of Star Trek that came to mind. Not the, not the gem that's down your throat. Mm -hmm. Like when you're thinking about that principle of you're afraid, like you think your life is about to end and you're thinking about all the future that you're not going to have. Oh my God, you know, what are all the things I'm going to do? And, and it's like, if somebody shows up and says, you will die in a minute, you react. It's, I, I mean, you, you, you do, you know, you're going to do whatever you're going to do. But if somebody says you're going to die in a year, you might, you know, you might react the same. You might react differently. I don't know. I think in both cases, you should probably do the same thing, which is think for a reasonable amount of time, about what you're going to do next. Um, you know, what were you, you know, I, th I think both of them don't, you know, because yeah, I, I, either way you get moments, you don't get a life. You get a bunch of moments and unknown, an unknown number of moments go with the, you know what are you going to do with those moments and you know it's always worthwhile to plan if you can or just be be free just enjoy them uh so there was an episode of star trek that uh star trek next generation that posed the question so what would you do if you could look into your future but not the usual 30 years or whatever four <laughs> hours into your future and and they had a fun episode where a person basically finds their future self four hours in advance and that person, and with the information they find out, they, they discover everybody that they know is dead, and this guy survived, and they wondered how that happened, because the people who found him were the ones that were also going to go. <laughs> so it's like, what do we do with this four hours? And it was kind of an interesting approach to how, how do yeah. you respond yeah. to it. Uh, that one's called Time Squared. Um, but the other one, which is unrelated to this, and so I'm, we're just spitballing fun stuff here, uh, was an episode that I saw today. I think I mentioned that I like science fiction. I like Star Trek in particular because it gives you a space to talk to talk about and think about the really interesting questions that are hard to deal with, interesting stories to tell that are hard to deal with because of our own personal prejudices sometimes. Uh, it's nice to give you a, a safe way to look at certain things that are going on. Um, and science fiction has that kind of power. I think a lot of science fiction writers don't use that power very well uh, but I think you know science fiction can uh, and and there was one story that I think is really reaching and I don't know if this episode was successful it's one of those episodes that's just I mean it's far gone but basically you run into a, a society that you cannot communicate with you you both have language but the fundamental ways that you use language are so diametrically opposed that though you hear words, none of it has any sense to you. And uh, the show was about one of the characters trying to figure out how anything about this people that, with whom you can't communicate. Mm -hmm. And you wonder, how on earth do we tell a story about people who can't communicate? It's not like... You know, like if you have a story where a guy just can't talk, but he can sign and gesture and all of that, and you can kind of piece together his motivations. It's not even that. You know, it's so wild. And that episode was called Darmok. For the people people who know S, you know Star Trek Next Generation knew what I was talking about for a while. But uh, it's it's really, really interesting. You don't have to know anything about anything to watch that. Mm -hmm. I think it's season three, D-A-R-M-O-K, Darmok. But it's uh, it's wild. And uh, it, I, I told my girlfriend who watched it the other day, that is a hard episode. You come out thinking, what? What was that? And I think that's kind of the point. I'm not sure that it was a successful episode. It's, I don't know that it's my favorite one, but I, I think I could probably watch that episode time and again, trying to figure out what's going on. It's weird. But uh, that's an interesting question. How do you, you know, because you can communicate, like, 
there's sto- there's stories about people who have deep relationships with animals, and that's I think those are really powerful stories. But there's a commonality there. There's kind of like we both have the events that we just experienced. You know, I, I think I heard an interview with a guy who I don't know what happened. He was stranded in the ocean, and I think either a whale, either a, either a whale. Some large marine mammal found him, saw that this guy needed help, and took pity on him, and kept trying to bring him food, mm-hmm. uh, and defending him from other predators. And they had this, for what for all practical purposes, of a brief relationship with this animal. That's so interesting. Uh, but in this episode, it was. You know, it was like they couldn't even get there because language kept getting in the way. I dare say language would have been better being put aside. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, you know, I, I think I saw that episode when I was a kid and didn't get any of it. And I think I saw it maybe 10 years ago and thought, what? And I saw it last night and I was thinking, that's, that's something else. Um, anyway. Oh, you might appreciate those a little. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I do. And that, and that it, it, it kind of... It, it it triggered this thing in me of of I I sometimes <clears throat> sorry I sometimes feel that way about about art that you 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 present it with some sort of piece of art where no matter what it is a painting or a, or a statue or or some sort of poet poetry or anything really and you simply cannot figure out what the point was like i do not i i do not understand what the what point the artist was trying to convey and the interesting thing about that is that although on the one hand that may be frustrating on the other hand every time you you come back to to artwork like that you can get something else out of it you can put another interpretation on it maybe maybe the point was this so maybe they were trying to communicate this idea maybe it was just absolutely nothing i don't know and i, I always find that interesting that i mean i i like i mean i like romantic german romantic painting but it's very clear what it is like that's what it is or what it represents, but but with with some art, it's 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 a very I think a very different uh, different approach. Uh, all right, well, forgive me. I got to ask. So, what do you think is the point of the Wanderer over the Sea of Mists by Casper yeah. David Friedrich? Yes, you, you know Casper David. C A S P A R. Yes, I know you like yes. it. That's what I'm just giving a shit. Yes, yes. So, nice. so, so what's the point of that? I think I think Friedrich had a. I mean, being a romantic painter, he he was like other romantics. I think very much about the the overwhelming power of nature being much more powerful than than humankind. Like b- b- people don't matter that much if you look at the, the 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 grand scheme of things. If you look at the power of nature, when I look at these kinds of paintings from from say uh, Friedrich or the, the one you mentioned, for example, I think the it, it always speaks to me as a kind of, of of isolation and and just just loneliness. Even when he has paintings in it with with multiple people, which he sometimes has a couple of people or a few couples or that kind of stuff, I always get this sense of 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 loneliness out of it and 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 isolation and you know everything that the giant skies the mountains and everything like we don't really matter or something so do you think he was trying to communicate this is do you think this was confessional art where he was trying to communicate his own loneliness i sometimes feel that way and i have to admit like i'm still looking like i, I should because i like i like him as a painter i like him a lot and i i i still want to read a good biography or something and so I, I i can't say that this is based in fact but but to me it, it often comes across that way as someone who's fascinated by that 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 sense of isolation and maybe yes maybe also suffered from a certain level of loneliness and, and expresses that in 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 his painted work you know i can see how i can see that perspective as a as a guy who's written i am not going to call them works of art i'll say i've written stuff as a guy who's written stuff designed to be consumed, 
I would be inclined to say that for that painting and for a couple of other paintings that do it for me in the same kind of way, for those of you who haven't seen it, I strongly recommend getting looking at a, an image of Wander Over Sea of Mist. Another one that kind of does it for me and that same that kind of evokes that mm -hmm. same sort of feeling is the uh, Arnold Birkeland painting, The Isle of the Dead. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, I, for full disclosure, I'm a music major. I studied classical piano in college. When you look up in the Grove Music Dictionary, Romanticism, you get the picture of Casper David Friedrichs yep. uh, wander over the sea of mist. And I know that I, I learned about the Isle of the Dead because it was the inspiration for the tone poem of, of the same name by Sergei Rachmaninoff. So full disclosure, kind of biased here. But when I look at paintings like that, I feel like if I were someone who, who drew that or painted that, I would say if there if there was ever a point, if there was ever any reason for me to do this, it would be if, for me to get a viewer and trap them in that moment. I wanted, mm -hmm. I would want to create a moment that you could fall into or just be in and just have it be something captivating. I just want to capture your attention and get you in wherever that is and just hold you there. I guess as long as as long as you could, as long as you want to be there, as long as I could hold you, I would say that would be the point. You know, in as much as it's fair to even ask, what's the point of something? Um, I really like uh, the classical music that kind of evokes a, a you know, it kind of takes you somewhere, mm -hmm. especially when it can take you somewhere where there's space. Uh, you know, I feel like this is like. For the record, for people who don't like Donald Trump, this is Donald Trump. They say that Donald Trump spews word salad. People talk in word salad all the time. Donald Trump's word salad is perhaps clumsy, but I am spewing articulate word salad right now. Full disclosure. Um, but I think when I listen to a piece of music that has space in it, I don't know. It, it's... It's so different from just entertainment, uh, you know. So for the the classical music that I like, so if you're interested in knowing, I would advise anybody who wants to hear what I would be if I were a piece of music, uh, 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 Alexander Scriabin's Etude in C sharp minor minor opus 42, number five. Uh, that's a great little piece. It sounds great, takes you somewhere, beautiful, but it's, but it, it, but it, but it, it's kind of self-contained. Mm -hmm. There's Within the music, there are, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't feel closed, but it's bound. There's, you don't get the sense in the music of being able to breathe free into it. And for that, I think it depends a little bit on the performance, actually quite a bit. But I think you can get that uh, when Arthur Schnabel gives you a slow movement. Arthur Schnabel is a, a uh, German uh, classical pianist who was famous for the slow movements of Beethoven sonatas. And uh, he knows how to give you space. And I think any composer who strives to give that feeling of space in the music and just openness, volume, whatever you want to call it, that's, that's, I'm, I'm really big into that. And, you know, that's something I kind of like. Whew, sorry about that. I'm just no, 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 no. I think, I think it's very interesting. So, for example, I, I, I because I, I think, I, I think I know what you mean. So, um, famous, famous piece of music that is, at some point, I think was used in pretty much every commercial and movie you could think of. But, but Eric Satie, the first Gymnopédie, uh, uh, famous piano piece, that, uh, and I, I. Uh, I like it, but at some point I found a recording from a Dutch uh, director, actually, but also pianist called Reinbert de Leeuw. And Reinbert de Leeuw um, plays it in such a way that I would say it's about twice as long as it usually is, much, much more slowly than... Um, usually fine i'm going to send it to you i'm going to make a note because it, you have to, you have to listen to that that specific version um and what's fascinating about it is that 
it it changes obviously because it's slower but it it to me it does exactly what what you said it gives you space it gives you as a listener space and it is quite polarizing because if you if you just if you just there's a recording of it on on uh, on on youtube and if you read the comments it's pretty much 50 50 people saying this, this is the best this is the best rendition i have ever heard of this piece and people who say this is way too slow this doesn't make any sense this is that this is so stupid it doesn't even make sense anymore so i find it fascinating to me that was really appealing that you do get the sense of space that you do have it's a very contemplative piece i would say it's especially if you slow it down a bit it's it's uh, yeah. And that's very interesting. You know, uh, as a guy who's played that piece plenty, uh, you know, the idea that somebody could take that thing and cut it in half, cut the speed in half, um, I, I'm, I'm thinking just technically as a pianist, you really have to dial up your nuance if you're going <laughs> to take the speed of something like that down. Uh, Chopin Nocturne in C minor, opus 48, number one, is, uh, I think, to, you know, you could it's got a lot of flexibility with the speed, especially at the very beginning. You can make it feel like time stands still, or you can just make it feel like a delightful walk in the park. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, but, uh, but yeah, that'd be interesting to hear uh, that Satie. Uh, that could be, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm not a big fan of fast tempos, but I am mm -hmm. a fan of making sure that the music carries me somewhere because I, I have heard some people play where I get the impression that somebody's just trying to show off. Mm -hmm. You know, or they're they're you know where they're as they would say they're breaking the they're not stretching the musical and they're breaking it. Um, yeah. There was a you know not to I'm you know uh, who cares if they hate on it. Daniel Barenboim's recording of the what is it the Pathétique Opus mm -hmm. Thirteen Beethoven. You know it, I think I heard a version of that. My I had a psycho music teacher in college who pointed that out to me, and we both agreed he takes so much time to get you know, between those little chord sections at the very beginning, it takes so much time. It just, Oh, it's just lost. But I will say, I think you need to, if, if you're, if you're interested in, and if you're interested in space, you will give the performance space to take you there. But if you're not thinking about space if you, or if you're not ready for it, it'll just rush over you or through you and it, you, you won't get it. It'll, it'll just go through your system. So, you gotta have to be in the mood. If somebody is trying to do that, you gotta give. You you gotta you gotta meet them. And I and I'd say you gotta. You know, ideal performances can be gripping. Um, we 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 like to think as performers that we can sit down, do our thing, and just bring people in through the sheer force of our desire and our artistic vision. But I think realistically, as a you, you know, the audience needs to come to meet you a little bit. Realistically. Um, yeah. You know, you, you could try to dial it in. And if you're really magnetic, you can work a person in, pull them in slowly with the right piece. If you're, if you're controlling all your variables, you know, what time is it? What kind of piece you're playing? Where you are? What, what's the hallway? How's the audience looking? You know, you could, you could work that in. But, but yeah, I think you kind of have to meet them there. And so if those people are ragging on that, video, on that, uh, that performance, you know, they, I got to ask, were you meeting them, you know? Did you feel like meeting him? You don't. It's not your job. You don't have to. But you, you, I think you do have to meet him. Yeah, and is it possible that it's just this? Because I, I'm, I'm, I, I think this is something. I, I, I will send it to you as soon as we're done here. Because now I really want to hear your opinion. But also, this would be a very interesting thing to continue on next time when you've listened to it. Because I would really like to hear your opinion. But any, anyway, but, 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 but having said that, I think sometimes it's also a matter of you may be so used to hearing something in a certain way that if someone then presents it in a different way, you think, no, this is wrong. And you don't give it the chance to, to, to say, oh, actually it's different, but interesting, for example. We call that listening with closed ears. Yes. Uh, a good you know, it, it's, it's a real, you know, it, it's kind of funny that in the world of, uh, of uh, well, I guess I have the whole show. All of it is mine. <laughs> oh, he's back. But, you know, it's interesting, you know, in, in school, it's so funny. The people, historically, this is a stereotype, this is historically, historically, the, the people who were most uh, uh, guilty of doing listening with closed ears are piano teachers. And the people 
who are more likely to try to meet the guy where he is are, are professional pianists. Not usually a lot of overlap. Um, it's just a thing that I've heard. I, I've known a number of people who are piano teachers who, you know, for one reason or another, they've already kind of decided how they feel about a particular piece and they, you know, that's kind of how they want. Um, and, prof- and pianists, they're just like, I'm trying to find what I want to say. Here, I'm going to say it. Okay. But if somebody else is going to play it, they had to do all of that stuff themselves. And if it's different, well, then it's just different. If I don't like it, I don't like it, but that's okay. Um, yeah. I'm, you know, pers- for myself, I, I have my, I have a few opinions on some things, but I feel like if I hear a recording of something and I say, okay, no, 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 this isn't cutting it. This is bad. I don't like this mm-hmm. at all. It's going to be because I, I feel like I have a justification for it. Uh, like, um, like if someone takes a word to mean something that it doesn't mean, you know, or if yep. they are legitimately going too fast in a piece marked, not too fast, you know, which is, you know, again, yep. it's all kind of subjective. It's not fact, truth, whatever, what does it mean? But, but yeah, I, I try, I try to be, I try to approach music with open ears. I, I do try. Um, yeah, but I, but I wasn't always, uh, wasn't always, uh, I don't know the best. I know when I was in college, I got a fair amount of heat for some outspoken opinions. Oh, that's one thing I wanted to tell you about. Some outspoken opinions. Uh, I did a, mu- a couple of music reviews that got not any kind of hate because this is back pre-social media. So, mm-hmm. you know, people right. just said, oh, okay, I don't agree, whatever, move on. Um, with some contemporary classical music, and we can talk about that, but... But, uh, but here's one thing I wanted to, I was, I was watching, I was watching, uh, the videos that we've made already mm-hmm. just so I could get a sense of what was said. And, you know, I was thinking, okay, I think I sound fairly clear. Call quality was good. Good things there. Yada, yada, yada. And I'm thinking, what's wrong? What's wrong with video or how I sound mm-hmm. or any of that stuff. And, I was just reminded, uh, I don't want, I don't want to sound like a know-it-all. And I think watching the video, people could probably get the impression that I think that I'm a know-it-all. I don't think I'm a know-it-all. I hate the idea of people who are know-it-alls, like they're so special, but there was a, you know, you know, I was I just wanted to tell you when I was a kid, um, Whenever I would do something, not whenever, but often when I did something I wasn't supposed to do, my mom would, uh, you know, chide me or something like that. And I had a reason, some reason. And it's usually, you know, well-meaning saying I didn't mean to do this because of whatever. And, you know, some people could call them excuses. Some people could call them explanations. I don't remember all of them, so I can't say. I know that an excuse when you're making an excuse, you're trying to get somebody to not do something or to do something because you don't deserve that treatment because whatever. But an explanation is just, here's why. Mm-hmm. Full stop, right? And she used to be annoyed with that. And, you know, usually when I would say it, she was in the heat of her moment or of her anger. And she would say, you got an answer for everything. And, you know, I, I at the time I would think, I don't even know, you know, I don't, I don't agree. I don't know what that means. You didn't ask me any questions. How could I have an answer for something that doesn't make any sense? I'm just trying to, I just don't want you to be mad at me. I just don't want you to be mad at me. And she would say that she'd been saying that throughout my youth. Right. So when I was in my early twenties, I just went through a really bad breakup and my trip to Paris for the first time, was coming later and i i went on this trip i was alone and you know my girlfriend at the time was supposed to go but she wasn't whatever went on this trip and i was you know the weather was you know it's paris so you know the weather was bad <laughs> yeah. um you know we know that van gogh was a little he had a screw loose because of all those blue skies you know that's a lie yeah. okay but so i was in paris and i was feeling bad feeling sorry for myself and 
and you know, I just wanted wanted to meet some friends, find somebody who wanted to be around me, you know, whatever. And I found this group of Dutch tourists, young people. When you stay at youth hostels, you meet other people. And I found this group of, uh, you know, bunch of Dutch tourists, and their English was, you know, good enough. And I didn't know any Dutch, so I was happy to have somebody who wanted to talk with me. And I don't know, I was talking with them during the day, and um, you know, I thought we were having a good time. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get back to something that we brought up earlier about criticism, you know, like how it hurts so much more <laughs> if it's true. But uh, at some point, I got, you know, I got the feeling, or they either said it, but more or less, the message was communicated. We want to go do this other thing, um, and we're not inviting you. And I came by and I asked, how come you didn't want to invite me? I thought we were getting along fine. And then one guy says to the other ones, give us a minute. And all but one of them left. And this guy said, well, Pierre, it's because you have an answer for everything. Uh, we think you're, uh, we just don't want to be around you. And, uh, I don't remember exactly how it worked out, but I, I guess, you know, he, you know, he was okay when he left and he left and that was it. And I, uh, don't want people to think that I don't have humility or that I think I know everything. I don't know how I present, uh, this is just who I am, and I've been like this for a very, very, very long time. Uh, I don't have an answer for everything. I would love to know more. I feel like there's a staggering amount of things that I don't have answers for, of information I don't know, and I feel ignorant of a painful amount a lot. Not all of the time, but almost all the time. Once we leave classical piano, fountain pens, manufacturing technology, chemistry, and, you know, basic math, I don't know any more than anybody else. And I don't know, I don't know political science or psychology or social sciences. You know, I'm, I'm pretty, you know, I'm like a four-trick pony. That's all I got. So uh, I probably should have led the videos with that so that people would watch to know that I'm not a, an unhumble no, I think. Well, no, I appreciate you sharing that. But I, I, I my, my, my first impression of the, the people in Paris was their loss, man, their loss, <laughs> and that's all I can that's say. That's what all losers say, though. No, 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 no. Their, their loss, and I think, I think, uh, I think the people, uh, our viewers, will, will agree with me here because. Here's, here's, here's what I think. The other thing that 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 struck my 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 mind was a um, a quote from uh, the Hagakure, which is a book. If you haven't read, you may enjoy. It's basically a, it's a manual. 1700s. It's a manual for samurai, how to live a samurai life, um, which is it's interesting. Some of it incomprehensible. Some of it think ah, neat. There's a neat way to look at things. Get it along. Yeah. Let's yes. Have a yes. Look at that. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I shall. Um, I'll make a note of that too. And there's this nice quote in there, um, think lightly, uh, Kure. now that I'm saying it, I think it's actually Miyamoto Musashi, which is also an interesting read, but I think the Hagakure is more interesting. Miyamoto Musashi wrote, <laughs> I didn't say anything about Hagakure, Miyamoto Musashi, <laughs> which I was talking about all along, wrote, Think, think light. Yeah, well done, right? And nobody knows. Uh, think, think lightly of yourself, but think deeply of the world. And I, I think that that is that is something that you do. And I, I, I don't think you, you, you are. Um, uh, I, I forget what term you use, but I don't think you are grossly misinformed or or, or ignorant or whatever it was you said about about specific things, because I think you have that that capacity you think deeply about the world and as a result i don't think you're a know-it-all i think you're someone who has very interesting thoughts about a lot of things and that makes it to me 
and I don't think I'm the only one because I think we have a large viewership in this because this is interesting, um, uh, because you have interesting opinions on all kinds of things, because you can think about things and you can think about things on your feet, which which I often struggle with, but you can think, you can come up with, well, you know, at some point I read this book that a girlfriend sent me and it was about, this, and you, you have this interesting, I'm, I'm just poking a little bit of fun here, but, but like you, you, you have interesting uh, way to look at things. And I think that's very valuable. That is not being a know-it-all. That is not some sort of uh, uh, arrogance or uh, thinking that, that I, 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 I do not perceive it like that at all. And I, 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 I haven't, I haven't really, from the first time I met you. I... Well, you know, this was 15 years ago that they told me this. I think I was uh, 21 or something like that. Or, you know, early 20s. And, you know, I don't know. I, for all I know, maybe I was coming off like, like that. But, you know, it was it just, it was a, it was a, it was rough. Um, you know, because they pulled that idiomatic phrase out of my childhood and stabbed me with it. Not yes. intending to cause damage, but it was just, yep. you know, when it was so true. And, you know, I, I didn't think that I was being a know-it-all. Maybe I was coming. I think, you know, maybe I thought I was being clever or something. I don't even remember what we, I don't remember what we said. The only thing that made it through history was what I told you, you know. So yeah, was, they, may, they may very well, or they probably had a point. But, uh, you know, it was just one that stuck with me. I, I, I don't know. I think maybe... Maybe if that hadn't happened to me, maybe I wouldn't have made such a cons so much effort to try try to grow to try to grow some fucking humility. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know. I uh, I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know. No, oh, I I think you have a lot of humility. So if that's what you sought out to do, then I think you've succeeded. Um, yay! Uh, but, humility. But, but, yeah. Yeah, but 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 no, yeah, and and it is it, it it is important. It is important that you. I think humility in itself is very interesting. I saw I saw once a um, a recording of a speech, short speech that Fred Rogers, Mister Rogers, gave. He um, he accepted some sort of award for his like his his life's work or something, uh, and it's very interesting because I mean think of think of the the say actors who receive an Oscar. Then it's oh my God, I thank God and Jesus, and I like I. And it's all so good that you know it's like Put yeah. On the music, man. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's like and, and that and 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 I'm not trying to uh, to make fun of religion here, but I mean like all these things they come and and then and then he did this and then she did that and then oh it was so fantastic, and then you had Fred Rogers who gave this this acceptance speech, and and the premise is something along the lines of. Well, I'm just so grateful that I have had people who taught me and inspired me, and I think everyone in their lives. All of us in our lives have people who have taught us, who have shown us thing and who things, and who have inspired us to be the best version of ourselves that we can be. I'm absolutely paraphrasing here, and I thought that was such a such an interesting way to to look at things, where instead of all the the the, the masturbatory of oh, and then I did this, and oh, so impressive, and oh God, then oh, it was so many. You can also look at it that that way, and that is that is a lot of humility more than I think many people would, would be able to muster. But I think it's a very interesting concept. Yeah, it's, yeah, humility, uh, I don't know. I, well, I mean, what is humility to me? What is humility? I'm inclined to say it's just like a willingness to accept that you might be fallible. Yeah, but maybe you're not right all the time, um, and it, it really thinking that you might not be right all the time. I have a friend that that I've known for a long time who says he doesn't know it all, but he does. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and you know, and over you know, and I and he's such a good guy. I've kept him in my life because he's such a great guy. And, you know, we're on a journey, I think, and I think 
we're just creeping along and you know he's getting better and better and better every year and that's all that matters to me uh i don't you know but you know he's come a long way i think from who he used to be and i you know but i just stay with him because he was a good guy and you know i think growing humility always is a good thing um I don't know. It's probably not the greatest thing to have in every leadership position because, you know, people don't always like to think that the guy who's making the choices is unsure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, but, you know, again, getting back to Star Trek, what would Picard do? You know, it's always a good question. What would Picard do? Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Humility. Yeah. That's what I think. What do you, what do you, what do you think humility is? No, I, I, I think, I think you're right. And I, I, I I'll, I'll I'll briefly describe my experience with humility because it was I found it very interesting in my own personal development. So I was I was a good student. I, academically, I, I, I performed well. So when I was working on my my undergrad uh, studies, I, I I consistently performed well. I had high grades, a good grades. I, I I did well. And then I did a, a master's in psychology, and uh, that was. In the Netherlands, things are a little different, but that was what we call a research master. So it's a, a two-year as opposed to a one-year master. It's more research-based, and it's the, the big thing is it's elective. So you actually have to apply. Whereas in the Netherlands, everyone can do a master if it's a regular master's for one year. You 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 don't have to apply. You can just do a master's. But this is elective. So you have to have good grades. You have to have recommendations from professors, etc. That kind of stuff. So I I came into that thinking, well. I've always been a really good student. I'm going to be I'm going to be among the best students there. And I was still I was still a very good student, but um th this is not this is not meant in any arrogant way, but I can't put it any other way. Like it's it's the, the cream of the crop of the students of that cohort that get into such a master. So all of a sudden you are surrounded by students who were all that good. So now all of a sudden you're not not automatically the best. You're just one of the students who happens to be very good. And then the final step was when I got my my PhD position at a different university from where I'd done my my bachelor and masters, um, you I, I came in thinking, well, I've done this master, I've I've studied with some really great professors, and I already have one publication that's about to be published, and um, like I'm I'm going to blow them away there in the department with my skills and my qualities and my you know, and 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 then on day one you find out that there are other people who are better than you and that was uh, that was rather a shock i shared an office with an incredibly gifted pg student it was, it was a great guy but he was very good he was very good at analyses at coding at reading papers at coming up with theories he was very 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 good and i was like my god i will never be able to live after that live live up to that and i still know if i live up to that I, I i don't think i do but that's why he immediately was hired as an assistant professor right after defending his thesis but but that that was so confrontational with not between him it was a super nice guy he wasn't a show off but for yourself to think there are people who are better than me and that's and that's uh, again this is not spoken in arrogance it was it was nice it, it gave me that humility of you know what people can be better than you and that's okay you're not the you're not automatically the cream of the crop but is it okay though i you know i i, I don't know <laughs> I, i've met people you know i i've met a lot of met a lot of smart people uh i have not met and this is the thing that's interesting in my experience. Mm -hmm. I have met a lot of smart people, but I have not met very many smart people my age who were perhaps like that. You know, yeah. just where they they were working so fast they make you look like you're standing still. Mm -hmm. um, who treated me well? That I would say I have not met. I have not that that's something I would like to see somebody who was. Way past, way out of my league, who didn't treat me like they were out of my league. But, you know, but because of that, it's hard not to think, well, okay, you meet somebody who's super sharp, who doesn't, and it's, it's just a great moment. They give you a look that, that immediately tells you that they think something, well, you yep. would understand, you know. Uh, and it's uh, it's hard not to think, well, so anybody who's 
So, oh, I found somebody who's better than me, but oh, they suck. Well, how convenient is that for my self esteem? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, maybe it's, I don't know, the idea of people being better than you in all the ways that you matter to yourself and have that be okay. I don't, I, you know, I wonder about that because I think the other day when we were talking about how it's a, it's a, it's an important skill to learn how to take somebody who takes a different viewpoint than you mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. something that's important and not taking it as an attack. That's yeah. important. But when somebody is basically you, but better, uh, I don't know. I, it, it, you know, cognitively, I think that's got to be okay. You have to find some way of being okay with that only because if you can't, you've got a problem. You've got an existential problem. Um, but realistically, I, I don't know. I think being around something like that, I can only imagine, you know, maybe, maybe you can help me out with this. Talk me off of this ledge. I imagine you'd have to get away from that. You'd have to find some way of, of, of getting your identity back. There's an episode of Frasier like this where there's this doctor who shows up and he's just better than Frasier at everything except singing, which is how they ended up the show. The guy mm-hmm. can't sing, Frasier can sing, you know, but if you did, but you know, it's like, you know, help me out. Yeah, 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 no, I think that's what it is because I, I was sticking like I had so I, I did like I didn't keep a, 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 like a physical list, but in my mind there was like, okay, so he is. He's an excellent coder, but this guy had he had when he was like a young teenager, he had summer jobs coding. So he could he could outcode anyone in the department. He was great at statistical analyses. He was fantastic at tying together literature and coming up with theories to explain data. So I had this sort of running list going of, I will never be able to live up to this if this is what is expected of me as a PhD student. I will not be able to do this. And the relief came the relief came exactly in the way that you just said, except it wasn't singing, but it was writing. It turned out that he struggled tremendously with writing papers. And that was just uh, partially because of English. English did not come as naturally to him as, as it, it came to some other people. Um, so that was something he struggled with. And then for me, there was the, ah, there we go. I'm better with English than he is. Done. Oh, and, and that's, yeah. And it's and it's weird. It's weird. And I, I also I'm also not saying that I feel good about that. And I didn't. I, I surely like it. It wasn't that, like I couldn't sleep over this. And then I I had peaceful, calm dreams again. Like it wasn't like that. But I do think that is a way of looking at it. Like well, but you do have strengths too. And there may be specific areas where you may be stronger than them. And I think that is human nature. I think that we look for ah, there you go. That's it. That's the difference. Oh, and that's why right. I. Have. So, so, uh, so let, let's just let's just play around with this idea a little bit further. Yeah. So, years ago, I used to have this. Uh, do you know what a doppelganger is? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, I was. I, I don't know. I, Schubert had a great piece called "The Doppelganger." It's a beautiful piece of music. Friedrich Fischer Dieskau. Everybody should listen to it. I was walking to a lesson. I had to go take a train, and I saw. Um, just a, I, I was I was walking over the expressway on an overpass, and I saw, I thought I saw myself, right. and I'm just playing like, what if, what if, what if there really was another you? The whole story was there, everything about you, except just better. Mm-hmm. All you know, whatever you had before, just better than you. I'm like, how could a person exist with that? Knowing that there's like, and especially if you met, you met if you met just once long enough to figure out that that was true, that the story, that the premise was there. Could you even deal with that? Uh, guys, I feel like, you know, like basically you got this person who has your identity and they are just better than you. And they went through everything that yeah. you went through. they just did it better. Uh I like the idea. The idea is you got to be a bigger person. Try to always be a bigger person. You know, it's okay to just accept that there are going to be differences and there are going to be people better than you. But, uh, you know, however, you being a bigger person, for the record, they're bigger than that. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they, they, they don't even think about you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, I think that would tear. I think that would tear me apart. Uh, again, talk. What do you think? Do you think that's something that people should be able to handle? And I, and if you want to say that's an artificial scenario, no, 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 considering, you know, that's fine. But. No, I think it's very interesting to consider. It's not something I have ever ever considered, but but it's an interesting idea. I, yes, I, I I think that would be, that would be very very difficult because you're, I think you are confronted with a lot if not all of your insecurities about yourself like you 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 may like i can imagine i'm not saying that you do but i can imagine as as say a pianist you might think well maybe i'm not good enough or maybe i'm not maybe i should do this better or, or have a better grasp of this technique or whatever and then you find someone who who is you and who has all of that I think it would be incredibly difficult, and in that scenario, it, you you wouldn't even really be able to 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 find that chink in the armor if he well, at least he can't sing, like you you wouldn't even have that because I'd be better at that as well, and then I think it would be, I I that's that's suicide material. I think that's that that becomes a matter. Of, <laughs> no, but seriously, because then you because then you, you you're outperformed in every single way, yeah. And I think that would be an enormous blow. Yeah, I I think so too. I I, I you know so. So let's just get back away from the abstraction. So let's assume that it's not you. Suppose it's a different person, but mm -hmm. similar. And, you know, like at some point, let's say we take that hypothetical better you and we walk it back a little bit. We walk it back a little bit. How far do we have to walk it back before we're out of the suicide range? Yes. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just thinking. I'm thinking about the, 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 the tale of William Wilson. Uh, the Edgar Allan Poe story, uh, and I don't know. I just, uh, I don't know. And, you know, it's probably an artificial idea because, you know, when you say this person lived basically your life except they did everything better, well, if you're going to argue that they really are you, they couldn't do any better because there's only one universe and this yes. is the one you get. You know, but you know, I feel like let's play with the game. It's just, I, I, I just don't. I, I don't think you can. I don't think you can. I don't think that's something that a person can live down. Respond in the comments. Hear what you think. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. But uh, you know, I uh, one, one on a on a related note, I've been thinking a little bit about this. This one of what I think are the base fundamental issues at play against conservative-minded people and liberal-minded people in America is this question over whether or not wealth is a zero-sum game. Um, I think wealth and true value is not zero sum and uh i think i can i think i can back that up with some truths you know it's it's hard to back up the facts but i think i think i can back it up a little bit uh, but that's that's a thing that i've been hearing that's that might be worth talking about uh you know because this i hear i have you know when we were talking about education you know there's a a fair amount of why should I do something to help somebody else that's not me? You know, why, why, why should I be bankrolling somebody else's improvement? Which is a fine question. Uh, I, you know, I just think I have a good reason for it. But, you know, it's just, it's just some ideas. You know, if you don't back it, then there you go. You're on the other side. That was something. What do you, you, want, to, you want to talk about that? Yeah. 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 The oh, difficulty, right, yeah. The di the difficulty lies, I think, in in when you when you choose to help others advance on whatever path they they choose or or may choose. You you invest. Um, quite heavily in in those persons in their in their education in their development and i i do find that both a rewarding and a, a, a draining thing to do i mean i you you instruct people i instruct people so i always find it I love to teach. Like I love, I love it. I think it is an incredibly rewarding 
profession and i also disagree with the statement of those who can do and those who can't teach i don't i don't i don't buy that i don't buy that I, it requires a certain level of passion to say yeah but i want to teach others about this um so i think you you need to have a certain level of 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 selflessness to to do that if i would say i'm not i i, I say this for like legal reasons i'm not complaining um, but I could probably make more money were I to go into industry than were I to, to teach at a college. But I love to teach at a college, which makes that worth it for me. I love to help students along on the journey, whatever it is they, they decide to do. And that does take a, a certain bit of, of selflessness, I, I think, to, to, to want to do that, to want to invest your time into the development of others. I don't know if that was really an answer to your question, but that was just what came to my mind immediately when you said that. No, uh, I, um, it sounds good. I'm glad that you want to be a teacher. I think you're, you're right. You do have to have a certain degree of selflessness because I know as a teacher, as a piano teacher, you know, there have been plenty of times where people have made the job hard enough that your own selfishness starts to bubble up to the surface and you start thinking about, you know, getting out and having a better time, making more money, doing something else. Mm -hmm. And it takes a certain amount of commitment to that selflessness to stay in it when it gets, when people are kind of edging you toward the door, you know, when they really shouldn't, mm -hmm. but, you know? Um, yeah. You know, when I was, I was thinking that podcast that I was referencing uh, a bit last week is called uh, nice white parents. And and I think episode four, they touch on this this principle that's really important. If you if you value like in one of my Instagram videos, I mentioned that if you want to have a functioning democracy, you need a highly educated populace. Mm -hmm. in democracy, the people get the government they deserve. And when you get people who can't think critically, who are unable to come to an agreement on what the facts are, you end up with with chaos. Mm -hmm. uh, at every level of government. And the theoretical, way, the underpinning for that is public education. You know, uh, it's, I, I buy into the idea. I think public education is important. But one of the fundamental issues, and I was thinking about this today, I was just listening to some of it again, was, uh, so, all right, how do you ensure that everybody gets up to that same baseline of good, good education? We're not going to make everybody the same, but how do you get at least give them access to the good quality education that you know that everybody should probably have? And there's talk about these two words that are kind of interesting, equity and equality, which is because we've got a platform, we're talking about things, let's talk mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. Um, the, the image that probably best helps me illustrate this um, is one I think I saw it on Instagram, but it's a it's a great little drawing and it's over it's simplified, but it does the job. It's a bunch of people trying to look at a baseball game by looking over the fence, and equality is giving everybody the same height milk crate to stand mm -hmm. on and look over the fence. But because everybody is different, some guys get the some guys don't need the milk crate, and some guys the milk crate's not tall enough. Um, one of the arguments, this is a, kind of an argument in favor of a thing educational people call tracking, where you have to set up tracks of different skill levels to meet students where they are mm -hmm. to get them as far as they can go. Um, I, am an, I am an advocate of tracking with as many tracks as needed. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's, that's, that's a quality. Equity is giving the guy the height milk crate that he needs based on how tall he is. Some guy gets no milk crate. Some guys get a enormous milk crate, you know, and, and that's, I think the principle is equity is probably the right one. Give people what they need to get as far as they can go in getting that education. The trouble seems to be that, you know, how do you pay for it? And we uh, run into this problem when a guy who's, say, if these, are, if these people watching the ball game are now students, the parents of the kid who doesn't need the milk crate says, why should my tax dollars go for paying for some other kid's milk crate? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I think the argument, because public education requires that it be so, if you want a functioning country, we got to have a good public education. That's the price we got to pay. I think 
if you can get somebody to buy into that argument, which I don't think is that hard. I think most people think public education is probably good. You know, they might not want to put their money where their mouth is when the time comes, but if they have a reminder, this is what we have to do to get that basic minimum standard, it can work. So I'm sure there's going to be some disagreement uh, in the comments about this. I imagine, you know, some people who go to very well-funded public schools who think that the public school system is fantastic and doesn't need to be tweaked can comment right alongside someone who is a great victim of what public school education in America looks like and say, no, it's terrible. We aren't living on the same planet. How can you say that? And each one says that to the other one. Yeah. Um, I would say it's also worth remembering uh, that people, I think, are willing to take a hit if they believe in this, if they can make a, if they can function a coherent narrative about it and they believe in the principle, I think people will take a hit. Uh, and, and I think that's the, you know, and again, this is me just not being a social scientist, not being a psychologist, but I just, I have some gut instincts about people. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the ultimatum game proves that to us. Do you remember that game? Yes, 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 yes. I think we can, uh, you know, the rough idea is, well, why don't you walk us through the ultimatum game and, and, and uh, tie this together? <laughs> The ultimatum game is a uh, sort of a social decision-making game that 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 researchers have people play in the lab, and um, typically revolves around uh, distribution of of money, um, uh, real or fictional, but works best if there is real money involved. So you end up. Like you take home what you end up uh, uh, collecting in that game, um, and it, it basically works uh, with with uh, uh, players uh, taking turns and um, um, making one player making a proposition as to how money is divided, um, and if a um, uh, if uh, Stephen, your skeleton wants to be in our show. That is creepy. Oh, well. that is. Yeah, that is <laughs> I don't even know how. I can't even reproduce that. Whoa, he that's just, weird. He just came in. Yeah, he just he, he just wants video, he weird. just wants to be there. Um, in a nutshell, so you can you can make propositions as to how that money is divided, right? You get a, a current like here's ten dollars divided between the two of you. And one player gets to make a proposition as to how that money will be divided. Now the interesting thing is that if um if I remember correctly, because I'm not, I'm also thinking of the prisoner's dilemma, and I think I'm now confusing the two. But if you, um, if you, if the the player to whom the proposition is made does not accept the proposition, then basically both players go home empty-handed. But of course, there are there are issues. So if you if you say, well, I'll take eight and you get two, then if the other player says yes, well, then you have more money. But it's likely that player is going to say no, and then of course you leave empty-handed. You get nothing, not even the Five dollars you could have had. Yeah. Could have had if the other guy had split it that way. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Right. I, I like the game because, as I understood the results, the, you know, the idea that people are these infinitely rational creatures, um, you know, it, it, it kicks that to the curb. For sure. I think an uh, infinitely rational person, according to what a Vulcan would say or something mm -hmm. like that, would mm -hmm. say any amount bigger than zero a person should take. Mm -hmm. But in reality, a person is more willing to say, screw you, we both go home empty-handed if they get an insulting offer. But it doesn't have to be 50-50. I think I've mm -hmm. heard that it can even be played down as little as 70-30 or 60-40, which means that a person is possibly willing to take a hit. Yes. Which gives me hope for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we can, I, this is what gives me hope that we can sort out this you know, our, we all want public. We all say we want public education. How willing are we to put our pocketbooks at stake, or realistically, the future of our children, our Absolutely. children's education at stake uh, for this question? Uh, the reason I got in on this is there was an advertisement for the for this show, the, the uh, Nice White Parents. A woman said there was a school they were trying to build in New York, uh, and you know, there's this you know poor black neighborhood, and you know, just for the record. 
America has been so institutionally segregated with so many policies that people think that the idea of black neighborhoods, white neighborhoods, Hispanic neighborhoods is a naturally occurring thing when it is not. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely not. That's that's we can talk about that later. But, you know, they they had they were trying to build a school near this, you know, this black part of town and a bunch of white parents uh, in the 60s wrote a bunch of letters to the school board about who about where to build a school saying, no, 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 don't build it over there. It's just going to create another segregated school, build it closer to our neighborhood so that our kids can go and we can have a nice mixed, you know, wonderful mm-hmm. melt, you know, melting pot scenario. So they wrote a bunch of letters. The white parents wrote a bunch of letters and they ended up moving the school to the edge of the white neighborhood and kind of far, a few blocks further away from the black neighborhood. So, you know, so they did that. But then when they actually got done with building the school, of all the people who wrote the letters, nobody sent their kids there. Yeah. And, you know, and when I heard that, I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Ibram X. Kendi has a book out called Stamp from the Beginning. That's the com- comprehensive history of racist ideas in America. And I don't want to read it because I'm already enraged. And I don't <laughs> I don't I don't need I understand. more pages to add to my enra- my ray rage. I, I already, yeah. you know, I, I love information. I, I would love to know. But holy moly, I, I'm, I'm already mm-hmm. upset. What do you want me to do? How are Anyway, so I, I'm sure that he he's probably got thoughts on this. But when I heard that, I'm like, oh, my God, what is this? So then I listened to the podcast and, you know, it was every step along the way. It's just, you know, it's it's you hear a bunch of people who are, they don't sound. You hear stories about a bunch of people who they don't sound like bad people. None of them sound like bad people. They're just people who want the best for their kids. And they have concerns about what they see based on these unexpressed biases that they have and they're just concerned and everybody has stuff like that you know concerns based on stuff that they see you know they may have heard it may or may not be true everybody's head is filled up with lint and nonsense like that but um but it's backed up with a whole bunch of institutional powers you know and it uh, and it plays out you know like i said last week i think if you listen to that show it is it is infuriating and hilarious to mm-hmm. see, to just hear it as a podcast. Oh, just, it's, you, you, it's hard to believe. It's just hard to believe. Like, I, I think there was a bit where they were talking about this, you know, they find this one school and they're like, well, you know, let's, I wonder if we can get a, uh, I don't know, uh, this is a, this is a kind of, you know, it's like there's this black school, it's kind of underfunded. Well, you know, I'm kind of interested in giving my kids the multicultural experience, you know, this white guy thing in this. So, uh, you know, maybe I can get more people to go in for this school if we can uh, get a, I don't know, like a French language program in it. And he, and, he, and he goes out and he raises this ungodly amount of money because he's, this is his job. He mm-hmm. goes out and he raises a huge amount of money to fund this program, and he basically circumvents the fundraising methods that the school already had in place. And one thing leads to another. He, he, he and, his, and his fellow nice white parents take over this school, and now – you know, there's a bunch of kids who are like, whoa, 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 where are all these white people coming from? What's this? And 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 then they talk, and then the podcast t- touches on this other wonderful issue that people look. There's two ways of looking at the exact same thing. Basically, here's a black school. A bunch of white people came in to give it some diversity. Two ways you can look at it. You can look at it as gentrification, and you can look at it as diversity. And divert, you know, the white kids, the white families were like, oh, diversity, it's great. Everybody, so many shades of brown and tan. Diversity is wonderful. And the white and the black kids, they're like, oh, man, it's just a matter of time until none of us can afford to live here anymore. We didn't want this. We just want a good school. We didn't want this. And I think that's a point that we need to talk about more. I swear to God, black kids don't need integration. They just want a fantastic school. That's mm-hmm. it. Once you get out into the world, which is integrated, then it's every man for himself, and then we play the game. But you know, we just you know, so it's like there's that, that they they talk about that dichotomy in the in that podcast, you know, and I think that's man, we we need to be honest, and we need to uh, that's totally worth it's worth talking about. So yeah, anyway, I talked a lot. What do you think? Pete? What do you? No, think? I think that's very, that's very interesting, and your perspective on that I think is is very interesting. It it. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I see that. And I can also see how... Um, I think that comes down as a lot of things in this realm do to people approaching this let's assume with the best of intentions as you said like they're trying to do good they're trying to help out they're trying to but without fully seeing all ends and without fully seeing what the consequences of those actions will be and without actually asking if this is really going to be an improvement or that this is an improvement from their perspective which may not be a perspective that is shared by the people actually undergoing the proposed changes and and alterations and such uh, i would love it if you had if you can give me the answer to that two things they mentioned that the his, the person who was doing this piece said that she's researched this information for a long time and what she's seen is it goes like this you got a school that has problems uh, somebody comes in some some usually some white families come in and say oh we, we want to go and make things better but we make it better to our terms blah 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 things get worse for the kids who are already there the people who live in the district whatever it is and then they protest in whatever way in which they can protest the school board says okay we got to we got to double check that all the information is what happened was what we have that it's that what we're talking about is true and then after a very long time, they do the tiniest amount of change in that direction. And then a few years go by, the kids graduate, you recycle the system, nobody remembers why anything was done, and then you repeat the process all over again and everything mm -hmm. slides back and you keep going over. And this reminds me of this, this very interesting cycle, uh, you know, interesting, I don't know, it's, it's a thought experiment, but it's real. Back in, back in the day before we were really spending any time on solar panels, there was a lot of talk about maybe nuclear energy is the way for the future. But the question is, what do you do with all that radioactive waste? And before any idiots comment about this, you can't shoot it into space and you can't shoot it into the sun, as great as that is, because you can't, because when you fly a rocket, there's a chance it could fail. You don't want to rain down fallout. You don't <laughs> want to do that. So we can't do that. You can't bury it in the ocean. You got to put it somewhere on land. And the question is, how do you draw up a sign that, that says, leave this alone for 10,000 years? That'll mm -hmm. work time and again. What's the sign look like? How do you know? And it's, 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 it's a surprisingly difficult question. You know, you'd think the skull and crossbones could work. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, you know, with our little experiments, it is not easy to come up with something that is consistent enough with the level of precision that you want when you're protecting radioactive waste. And for something that's as complicated as stay out, leave it alone, don't touch this, how do you write it in a law that keep these policies in place because they are for this reason? Yep. I, I talked to my friend, uh, that, that same friend who's a, a political centrist about why government is hard. He's one of those people who says less government is better because it's better. And I said, no, good government is extremely difficult, but it's also essential because from my pen making experience, whenever you try to write a procedure that says everything that you need to know to make the procedure go the way you want, those procedures get unreadable fast. Mm -hmm. So it's not as easy as just saying everything in the text and then, you know, hoping for the best. You got to kind of have to install a guy whose job is to make sure that you read every word of the procedure yeah. who stays there forever who trains the next guy to take his place that could work but you know he, he, i don't know it's 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 a hard job i don't know i've been talking a lot no 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 I, that, that's that's fine yeah that, that that is an issue and i think that we we often um i think we human beings are very good at at repeating themselves repeating their their the kind of same mistakes and 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 forgetting about these kinds of things forgetting about um why would we do something like this in the first place uh, maybe it was better maybe it was not better that is something that time will tell but 
but we probably did something for a specific reason and i think that it, it to, to me it becomes something like don't don't fix it if it ain't broke at, at some point i'm not saying that in this situation that you mentioned about but schools and such i'm not saying that the system is not broken but but like in 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 a more general sense the need to intervene the need to continuously come in and improve things I think is noble, I suppose. If you want to really genuinely improve something, want to genuinely make something better. But I think what people forget is that they come in with their own perspective and their own perspective on how something may be improved may not be what actually works for that specific project, community, whatever it is that, that you are trying to improve. And I think if people would, would be better or would learn to be better at considering other people's perspectives, considering other people's viewpoints, considering what that community group of people, whatever you're talking about, requires, things would be a little different. But I'm not saying it's easy. Well, well, what do we do? Statues? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I guess, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, why don't we start with this next time? Uh, sure. I, gosh, I, I think about this this question. How do you, how do you make sure that people don't have the opportunity to forget or ignore what they need to remember to keep? Yeah. institution alive yeah. because you know it's uh with a business if it dies because it stops making money that's fine let it die i was not thrilled about the automobile bailout in 2009 uh mm -hmm. i like barack obama but i disagreed with that uh but you know it's uh i don't know i, I mean the I, statues are nice i don't know i don't know what else but you know it's Let's let's mull on that one maybe. Let's see what yeah, we get. That's uh, a good one. It happens to be the case that this was about two hours, so that would be a great um, a natural uh, natural break, and we will continue it next time. Yeah. It just keeps coming. Yeah, it just keeps yeah, flowing. Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. I think that was uh, th to me that was a very interesting discussion once again. So I appreciate I appreciate the uh, the, the the conversation because I always feel I. I walk out of this with stuff to think about and different viewpoints and things to things I have learned. So it's really neat. I like it. I, you know, I, I have a good time. Uh, yeah, you know, and while we're plugging things, let's see what the audience wants us to talk yeah. about. If anything for next week, I, I'd be curious to see. Yeah, absolutely. Let us know. We shall uh, check the comments, uh, and uh, yeah, we shall. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you all very much once again for watching. We appreciate it. We had a conversation before we started to record about making this shorter, making it longer. And 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 Pierre's uh, comment I really enjoyed was, well, it's just a conversation. Maybe sometimes it'll be shorter. Maybe sometimes it'll be longer. Depends on the conversation. And I kind of like that viewpoint. I mean, there may be times we think, God, what an asshole. And five minutes later, it's over. You know, like it's the five minute conversation, which is done. You know, it, it could happen. I don't think it will. But we will see. So we'll see. we appreciate we appreciate your viewership. We appreciate you sticking around with us. Leave us comments as to what you would like us to talk about, and we shall see what we can do. Yeah. I like that apples. Boom. All right. Thank you very much. See you next time. Goodbye.